people's cat. So you've come out of lockdown. When would you go back into lockdown? So you probably really should watch the first video of this series where I actually talk about why lockdown is important and the indicators that I'm using in real-time data to actually show that COVID-19 disease is an actual real threat and that what you should do in terms of getting data and interpreting the data. That said, let's get into it. You have decided, in your personal circumstances, that lockdown, strict lockdown, no longer applies. So what happens next? So you've made a personal decision about your local area. You decided that the chance of catching getting infected from another human being in your personal area <coughs> is unlikely. And that was a little break to bring the dog down. Because kitty's outside putting mulch on the garden. Life goes on. Anyway, so you decided it's safe to enter a period of not being locked down. Now, doing it gradually, I think, is definitively the way to go. The last thing I would remove is hand washing in public. And maybe we're all saying, well, no, I'll always forever now wash my hands when I've been shopping before I get in the car. But we're human beings and Spanish influenza in 1918 to 1920, public hygiene improved enormously. Spitting would drop down, people washed a lot more, people were much more clean. And they thought and hoped it would last, and it didn't. And when we had Asian flu in 1957, same thing. When we had Hong Kong flu in 1968, same thing. When we had swine flu in 2009, same thing. A lot of people after SARS in 2003 in Toronto, where I work as a nurse and Kitty works as a nurse, should have been very, very clued in to protective personal equipment and the signs and symptoms of a new flu or coronavirus coming at them in their workplace. And they were. So the first thing I want to talk about is wave phenomena. Most flus, influences, coronaviruses, pyron diseases, Diseases that affect human beings on an epidemic scale and become a pandemic as multiple countries have epidemics tend to have wave phenomena. Not always. Sometimes there is one wave, sometimes two, sometimes three, sometimes four, sometimes five. And it's a very definite epidemiological fact that you don't know if the particular virus or influenza virus or coronavirus or whatever it is, is actually going to have wave phenomena. So when you actually come out of personal lockdown for COVID-19 disease, because you're trying not to get yourself infected with SARS-CoV-2 virus, one of the things you're going to have to do is you're going to make a decision. Is this going to be, I'm out and it's done, America's open again, there ain't no problems anymore, we've defeated it, everything's rosy, or are you going to come out thinking, hmm, I vaguely remember Hoople's cat telling me there could be a second wave. So that's one of the things that I want to talk about is the waves. I'm going to show some slides showing the different waves from different influenza outbreaks. And I'd like to point out at this point that we do not know, nobody knows if there will be a second wave or not. I'm getting heartily sick of people saying, here comes the second wave. The second wave that we're seeing all around the world right now that's being labeled second wave is in fact the first wave that has not been completed and lockdown has opened up too soon so more human beings have got infected. We don't have a second wave. What China's having is the first wave outbreak in an area that didn't have it in the first place. So it's indicative of a second wave is that you will have a large volume of infective cases in an area that previously had a large body of infected cases. So if you're looking for a second wave, that's what you should be looking for. Not an increase in daily infection or daily death count in your local area. Initially, what you're looking for is a new peak starting. And it's very dramatic. So it should be as dramatic as the first one. Might not be, might be not as strong. Might be the same strength, might be worse. Okay, let's assume we all cop a huge, huge mega break on planet Earth and SARS-CoV-2 virus only has one definitive peak after which the virus weakens so it doesn't really transmit and it doesn't really cause too many issues. So there's not actually a second wave. So let's assume that happy event. And that happy event could happen, nobody knows. It's unlikely, but that could happen. So when you come out of lockdown, you come out of lockdown because the number of infected cases in your local area plummeted, dropped dramatically to almost zero. And the people coming into your local area, coming in from areas where their infection rate, their daily infection rate, is a lot less than it has been previously. In fact, it's almost zero. 
and you come out of lockdown, you come out in phase lockdown, you will start to shop more often. Everything opens up again, the economy booms, everything's grand. So that's the first peak. Now this kind of blends into something I want to talk about, is that we have a human desire to believe authority figures. And the authority figures we have in our three great countries that most of my subscribers come from, the United States of America, Canada and Great Britain, have had a flawed history with the pandemic. All three of them have done substantial things wrong in the pandemic to this point, and all three of them are continuing to do things wrong. I'm not going to go into a critical analysis of what Johnson in the United Kingdom did wrong and what he's still doing wrong, nor what Trudeau did and what he's doing wrong, nor what Trump is doing what he's doing wrong. There's enough information out there to make it apparent that as authority figures, as leaders of our countries, they are not the people that a smart person would listen to in making a decision to either go into or out of lockdown. So with one peak, you come out of lockdown, you make the decision, you come out of it, you start to do things differently, you go out more, eventually you go to the cinema and sit next to people, and go to rock concerts and stand next to them. <laughs> and stand next to them without any thought of getting infected from them. So there's a psychological component as well as a risk component. You assume the risk component is almost zero, you come out of lockdown, you actually move around more, you actually close in space and you talk to people more and more. So that's first peak, it's gone, it's over, we recover economically, people write books, they make films about it, preppers spend huge amounts of videos showing you what you should have in your EDC for a pandemic, too late, but anyway, that's what will happen, people will make money and things will go back largely to normal. But this is what I would suggest you do in terms of a phased lockdown event. First, in terms of locking down, coming out of it, the first thing you would do is that you would actually start to be closer to people on a more frequent basis. So you're going to shop more, you're going to be less careful at work, you're going to be less careful at the gas station, you might start to use public transit without a mask or gloves or hand sanitizer, I would still advise you to put the mask, hand sanitizer and gloves on, but you might start to feel that it's safe and you're not going to do it anymore. Now where are you going to get the information from? People get the information from the most unlikely sources and it's not always the best sources and nor am I the best source for you in your personal circumstance. You have to be very, very careful that the information you get isn't biased by your own beliefs. For example, there's a lot of people online who are convinced, absolutely convinced, that uh, COVID-19 disease has hardly killed anybody in America and the people it's killed would have died anyway and that a lot of people have died having called that and they're ignoring baseline death rates which clearly show this is a really killing disease they're ignoring a lot of evidence with a willful desire to not understand and not accept how dangerous this virus is to them and their loved ones and that's human nature but I would argue preppers should be beyond that you should be able to go what are the holes in my logical argument there's a lot of certainty in prepping and it always makes me laugh because anybody in a survival situation who goes into it is certain that they know what they're doing and this is the way to approach it and never queries their own decision making is probably going to die. So you gradually resume normal life. Now that being said, I'm going to gradually resume normal life but some of the things that I'm doing now I'm probably going to keep on doing. I'm still going to probably change our shoes when we leave the hospital. It makes sense. Kitty's probably still going to wear scrubs in the hospital rather than come in and out of the house with her own scrubs, even though they're not that fashionable. I'm probably not going to shop as much. I'm probably not going to fly again unless I have to. I know I never will go on a cruise now. I have never been on a cruise. I almost went on one when I was 10, but my mother wouldn't pay for it. It was a school trip heavily subsidised. Anyway, I didn't get to go on that and I've always been mad about it. But now I never will put myself in an enclosed metal object on the ocean. Uh, breathing the air from other people. So all of those things I would do, and if I'm going to fly again, I would fly because I had to and I would wear an N95. I think there's an issue of paranoia, but there's also an issue of being sane. You don't know if the next pandemic is coming or when it's coming. We know that pandemics are increasing in frequency. So anyway, you've come out of lockdown, there was only one peak, everything is just A-OK. -okay. But here's the question, all of those videos you've watched on the second peak, it's coming we don't know. We think it is. We don't know. How many of them have told you what the approximate length of time is between the end of peak one and the beginning of peak two? Slides. 1918 to 1920 or even 1922 if you want to argue it, saw the world's worst known influenza pandemic. 
known as Spanish flu. Everybody's trying to change the name now, not to offend the Spanish, because it wasn't the Spanish, it was the Kansas flu. But anyway, whatever, had three peaks. The first peak killed a heck of a lot of people in England and Wales and in America. It had three peaks, and then there was a period of time between the end of the first peak, where there was almost nobody catching it. Some people were, but very few. Almost nobody was dying from it. Everything was great. Everything went back to normal. Boom. Second peak. Same thing. That dropped, and then it started up again. You could argue, and I will argue, that you need to look historically to look at the approximate amount of time between the peaks. A lot of people are using different methodology, and I'll get into that. So approximately, approximately, first wave finished in England and Wales, and then they had about a one and a half month, a six week period before the second wave. So that's something you might want to take on board. During those six weeks, people are freely moving around, the disease is circulating, it's not really causing any obvious infections or any obvious deaths, and then boom, it reignites. So that's a period of time. If you can get through probably three months with no reinfections, you might be safe. But as you can see between the second peak and the third peak, there actually was probably about two to three to four weeks maximum. So the length of time is not really that well determined. Just a little bit on Asian flu in 1958-57. It actually killed quite a lot of people, uh, killed a lot of young kids. It was a major thing around the world. And as you can see from these slides, it actually did damage the economy. Not hugely, but partially. And of course, the economy recovered. So you can see that the S&P 500 dropped 20.7% because of a pandemic. So again, we have to look at the current Dow and wonder what's going on, what's altered it to keep it high. So again, you can't really use economic statistics to decide that the pandemic is over. Much like Spanish flu, the swine flu pandemic in 2009-2010 actually had three waves. The first wave was the worst, the middle wave was a blip, and the third wave was minor. This was supposed to be the big pandemic that was going to destroy everybody. The World Health Organization announced it was a pandemic. A lot of people spent a huge amount of time and effort on this all around the world, and it didn't really kill that many people, nor really infect that many people. So it made the idea of a pandemic a bit of a joke and a bit of a risky proposition, which 11 years later, caused us some issues. So this is the map of originating points of epidemics and timeline. So you can see that there has been a few over our lifetime. Swine flu is not included in this. I would have included swine flu in this, but I guess it was never epidemic in China, or at least not recognized as such. This was an estimate in 2006 of the economic costs of different strengths of flu pandemics. Bearing in mind SARS-CoV-2 virus is a coronavirus, but it's acting very much like a flu influenza pandemic in terms of its effects. They were estimating, worst case, there could be 71 point million dead people and that the economics of the world would drop by about 5% GDP over the course of that year. I think this has been a gross underestimate and maybe overestimate. The death estimate may be overestimated. The economic effect has definitively been underestimated. I don't know how much this is going to cost it's going to cost an awful lot of money. We're in the first wave of a pandemic. We are at the beginning of it, maybe the middle of it. It won't be over this first wave for two to six weeks from now. Depending on where you are in the world, it will have different timelines depending on where you are. But nobody can say we're over this for another two to six weeks. We probably should be in lockdown for another two to six weeks as communities. I will be in partial lockdown for the next two to six weeks anyway because I don't take my advice from politicians and from economists and from YouTube videos or even really from scientists. People, a large number of them are in the dark on this. We don't know how it's going to go. So that's what I'm going to be doing. But even then, once I feel there's no more infections or very few infections in my local area and hopefully very few infections in the world, I am going to wait a minimum of eight weeks, eight weeks before I start to take the gloves and the mask and the social contacts away from what I've been doing to lock myself down as much as I realistically and sanely can. That's the message. Local infection rate is the only indicator of when lockdown should end. 
local and international and state and county infection rates don't mean much of anything if nobody's coming into your county and your county is safe. Probably that's not going to be the case. So we're looking for a basic, a flat line, a flat line at almost zero of new infectious cases for about a week to two weeks before anybody should be thinking of coming out of lockdown. And people say, well, the economy can't stand that. Well, the economy can stand that. The economy could cope with World War I and World War II. And as I keep telling you, people aren't having the mindset that a pandemic is a world war and not getting the mes message. You know, more Americans have died in this pandemic than died in Vietnam. I think before this is over, more Americans will die in this pandemic than died in Vietnam, World War I and World War II combined. It's that serious. And we should be treating it seriously. And you can look at these sort of a slide, and there's lots of information. Early lockdown, strong lockdown that goes on for a long time, saves lives, and actually helps the economy. And that's the important message for governments. But as an individual, stay in lockdown, full lockdown, for at least eight weeks, eight weeks, maybe 12 weeks if you're completely paranoid, after the infection rate in your local area and nationally drops to almost zero. Be very aware you get infected by viral infections during the beginning of the first wave when nobody's doing anything sensible and they're all out and about and they're all rushing to Costco and touching each other trying to get their toilet roll. You also get it on the drop slope of the first wave when everybody goes, let's open up, let's open up, we can't stand this, we have to have a haircut, the economy is going to be destroyed, the cure is worse than the disease and all the other whining and untruths that you hear from various people. So that's when you as a prepper need to be locked down tight, really tight. And I'm arguing you need to be locked down for a further 8 to 12 weeks after there are no more local infections in your area. As much as you sanely can. If you have to work like me, if you have to go and shop, which you probably will, if you have to take care of children and dogs and family, yes, but do it sanely. Don't be rushing to the caravan park with all of your nearest and dearest friends to have a good drink for the whole weekend because you think it's over. This isn't over until it tells us it's over by not coming back. And we have no idea. So that's my message. Until there's an effective and safe vaccine, and that will maybe never happen, we cannot take the risk of our own lives of not treating this as seriously as you would treat it if Russia had nuked Washington DC. This is a world war. We're all involved in it, we're all fighting it. Some people aren't taking it seriously, some people are dismissing it, some people are getting angry, some people are completely freaking out and getting so depressed they might kill themselves. All of the huge, wonderful variations of human life, we will see, and we will see in any event. But make no mistake, this is a global, temporary SHTF on an unprecedented scale that nobody making videos has ever lived through. You'd have to be 106 to remember the Spanish flu now, and this is as bad as Spanish flu. People keep saying why this is not Spanish flu. Well, it's not an influenza virus, okay, and the world's different. But essentially, from my perspective as a registered nurse, I don't see any difference. Yeah, sure, we can give antibiotics and ventilate people, and we can use dialysis. But at the end of the day, only a few people are going to get saved that way. Um, massive and everybody wants to know when's the economy rebounding when's the mortgages coming back up when and when 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 like stop whining about the fact that the world in February 2020 has got it will come back and when it comes back it will be very obvious when it's coming back that is completely unknown utterly completely unknown what we do have is historical facts and historical facts say this is wave one of a pandemic you should be locked down as hard as you can. If you can't, then you do what you can. If you could be locked down tighter than you are right now, please take this message seriously. I'm not here to sell you Amazon products or anything else. I'm not here to sell you conspiracy theory. I'm not here to make my share prices rise. It took a bit of a ding, not much. But you must absolutely take this as seriously as you would as if Russia had nuked Washington DC. This is a world war. This is World War C, and I'm horrified at the number of so-called preppers out there that are trivialising it 
or distracting away from the actual issue. The actual issue is how safe will the food supply be in your local area? How infectious is it in your local area and what can you do to prevent the infection spread to you and then from you to other people? You know, this claiming you don't want to wear masks and it's an infringement of their civil liberties. Yeah, okay, let's spread the infection far and wide to everybody because I happen to be healthy and I've decided that only dying old people catch it, right? I mean, it doesn't make logical sense, but very few things do in a stress situation. And I feel sorry for these people, the people that have beards, the people that are still going out and about, the people that are just saying this is rubbish, there's nobody dying really from it, the hospital's being paid to inflate the numbers. They're willfully not looking at baseline death rates, they're willfully ignoring history, and frankly, it's quite dangerous. The other thing, and I've said this before and I'll say it again, no paramedics, no fire services, no police people, no nurses, no doctors if you can, know those people, ask them, listen to them. What are they seeing at their workplace? Are they seeing an unknown infection? Are they seeing a strange spike in heart attacks or strokes? All of those things are clues there may be a pandemic or another wave starting. Take the clues, take them seriously, we're locked down, I'm locked down, at least through the rest of the summer. Will the fall wave come? I don't know. If it does, it's really late. Traditionally, historically, wave two will come in June or July of this year, not in September. I could be wrong. Who knows? And it may not come at all. That would be great. Anyway, remember, in SHTF, tomorrow will always be worse than today, unless you prep. And in a pandemic, tomorrow will always be worse than today, until the peak is over. The peak, wave one, is not over. Stop listening to people who are telling you what they want you to hear and what you want to hear so you can go about your business and go back to the normal life of February 2020. It isn't coming back. It's not coming back for at least two years. You need to brace, brace, brace for a very bumpy 2020. It is going to get better, but it's not going to get significantly better this year. 2021, who knows? Toodles. This was Bad Terrier 2020 production.